Hi, I'm Christina Kent. I'm a staff attorney in the Judicial Administrator's Office of the Louisiana Supreme Court, and I'm here today to speak with you about ethical guidelines for judicial campaigning. There are many rules applicable to candidates of all types, but for our purposes today, we're gonna to talk about the most prevalent issues that the Judicial Campaign Oversight Committee sees over the course of a judicial election. We're going to go over three things today, the rules applicable to judicial candidates, important entities here at the court for you to know, and finally, the most important restrictions in Canon 7 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. With regard to the rules applicable to judicial candidates, just like all candidates for public office who engage in campaign fundraising, campaign finance rules are very important. All questions regarding campaign finance rules and the reports that you have to do should be directed to the Louisiana Board of Ethics. For our purposes today, the most important restrictions for you to know are those contained in Canon 7 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. As you well know, the Code of Judicial Conduct is applicable to judges statewide. However, during the course of a judicial campaign, judicial candidates are subject to Canon 7 in its entirety. We will go over the important restrictions in Canon 7 later in this presentation. Another important rule that I wanted to make you aware of is Rule 40 of the Louisiana Supreme Court Rules. This rule deals with personal financial disclosure reporting. Public officials in Louisiana usually do all personal financial reporting to the Louisiana Board of Ethics. However, judges and judicial candidates are required to file their personal financial disclosure statements with the Louisiana Supreme Court. When you go to the clerk of court's office and qualify as a candidate, you will receive a packet from our court. In that packet will be a blank financial disclosure statement and the instructions for completing the statement. The statement is due back with our office within 10 calendar days of your qualifying. Serious penalties can be incurred if we do not receive your personal financial disclosure statement. The statement is also available on our website, lasc.org, under the tab Forms for Judges. We are also going to go over some important entities here at the court for you to know. The Judicial Campaign Oversight Committee was created to help you comply with Canon 7 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. The Campaign Oversight Committee consists of 15 members, including retired judges, attorneys, and citizen members. Again, we are here to help you comply with Canon 7 of the Code, but we are also here to help deter unethical conduct. We do that by receiving complaints of alleged violations. The committee then engages in an investigation of the complaint, and if the committee finds that the complaint has merit, we can do one of many things, including informal resolution of the complaint or issuing a public statement. But again, we are here to help you, so please contact me if you have any questions regarding ethical campaign conduct. A really important entity for you to know here at the court is the Judiciary Commission of Louisiana. And Commission Counsel Kelly Legere is here with me today to discuss the Judiciary Commission and its applicability to you as a judicial candidate. So Kelly, tell us a little bit about the commission. The Judiciary Commission of Louisiana is an entity that was created by the Constitution to investigate complaints of misconduct and disability involving judges. And the commission works in tandem with the Supreme Court. It's not a part of the Supreme Court or an arm of the Supreme Court, but it works in tandem with the court in that the commission does not have authority to discipline or remove a judge, and the court doesn't have authority to do those things without the commission. Okay. The commission has to recommend to the court discipline, and then the court can act. It doesn't happen without the commission's involvement. That's great, Kelly. So that's an important distinction there, but tell us a little bit about the commission's involvement with candidates for judicial office. Candidates may think that they don't have to worry about the commission because they're not yet a judge. However, the commission does have jurisdiction over judicial candidates, and that jurisdiction arises under Canon 7 within paragraph G of that canon because a successful candidate can be called upon to answer for misconduct that occurs during the campaign. If the candidate is unsuccessful, the candidate's slate is not wiped clean and the candidate cannot believe he or she is in the clear because misconduct that the commission has during the campaign could be referred to the Office of the Disciplinary Council if the person has an active law license and that office could pursue 
that complaint, investigate it, and then recommend discipline to the court if necessary. A final important entity for you to know here at the court is the Committee on Judicial Ethics. The committee issues ethics advisory opinions on proper interpretation of the Code of Judicial Conduct. When judges or judicial candidates have questions regarding the applicability of the code to a particular situation, they can request a formal advisory opinion. Our committee has issued many ethics advisory opinions over the years regarding campaign conduct. We're going to go over a few of the important ones later in the presentation. As I said earlier, for our purposes today, the most important restrictions for you to know are those contained in Canon 7 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. Again, Canon 7 becomes applicable to a person when they become a candidate for office. The code defines when a person becomes a candidate for office when one of the following occurs. The person makes a public announcement as to their candidacy. The person qualifies or files as a candidate with an election official or the person authorizes the solicitation or acceptance of contributions or publicly stated support, whichever occurs first. This is an important rule to remember. As soon as you make a public statement as to your candidacy, you then become a judicial candidate and you are fully subject to the restrictions in Canon 7 of the Code. Now we'll go over some of the most important restrictions in the Code, the first being the prohibition against solicitation or acceptance of campaign funds. This is contained in Canon 7A6 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. You as a judicial candidate cannot engage in any fund solicitation or acceptance of funds. This includes endorsing the back of a check or cashing a check written out specifically to a candidate. This is why the Code of Judicial Conduct in Canon 7D addresses the creation of campaign committees. Campaign committees are the only entity that can solicit and accept donations on behalf of a judicial candidate. This is different from candidates for other public offices, so keep this in mind with your campaign committee and with your campaign advisors. You as a judicial candidate cannot be involved in any way, shape, or form in the solicitation or acceptance of funds. Therefore, you should not have funds mailed to your law office. You should not send out invitations to fundraisers or invitations to any event where an ask for money could occur. Often I am asked who can serve on these campaign committees. Your spouse, your parents, your employees. This is addressed in Canon 7B3 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. It states that a judicial candidate must take reasonable measures to ensure that others do not undertake on behalf of the candidate measures which the candidate is prohibited from taking him or herself. So this is important with regard to fund solicitation. With regard to the reasonableness of the measures that you have to take as a candidate, commentary to Canon 7 states that the reasonableness will depend on the relationship that you have with the person. Employee's conduct can be prohibited because that employee works directly for you. With regard to family members, you can encourage them to help you in compliance with the code. Therefore, with regard to service by family members on your campaign committee, you should ensure that there is enough distance between you and that individual so that their conduct cannot be impugned to you. I'm often asked when there are rumors regarding a judge retiring in a district, when a judicial candidate can begin soliciting and accepting campaign contributions through a campaign committee. The code states that a campaign committee may not engage in fund solicitation or acceptance more than two years prior to an election. If a vacancy has not yet occurred, it is not yet clear whether the election will occur within two years. Therefore, you cannot begin fund solicitation and acceptance through a campaign committee until the vacancy occurs and it is clear that the election will occur within that two-year period. One of the biggest issues right now in judicial campaigns is the use of social media. The Committee on Judicial Ethics, which I discussed with you earlier, has issued two very helpful ethics advisory opinions regarding the use of social media in judicial campaigns. These opinions are posted on our website and I encourage you to thoroughly review them as they are very helpful. Both opinions address the fact that you and your campaign committee may use social media and websites during a judicial campaign but obviously because you as a candidate cannot engage in fund solicitation or acceptance, only your campaign committee can do such through a social media page or website. 
One of the most problematic aspects of the use of social media or websites during a judicial campaign by a campaign committee has been the posting of first-person statements of a candidate on a page which also asks for money. To the public, this looks like a judicial candidate is engaging in improper fund solicitation and acceptance. So please be very careful when your campaign committee uses such sites for fund solicitation purposes. Opinion 272 addresses the linking of your social media or website page with that of your campaign committee. This opinion contains very specific language on the proper way to engage in such conduct. Again, please thoroughly review both of these opinions, and if you have any questions, please contact me. The biggest issue that the Judicial Campaign Oversight Committee sees on a yearly basis is a violation of Canon 7A9. That's regarding false statements during a judicial campaign. Canon 7A9 states that you cannot knowingly make or cause to be made a false statement concerning you or your opponent. Again, the largest number of complaints that we see as a committee are regarding this canon. Please make sure when you are producing your push cards or putting out statements on social media or engaging in other advertisements that your statements are factually correct. One of the biggest issues that we see with this particular canon is the use of the word judge. First off, it's important to note that you should use the word elect or for in your campaign advertisements when noting the office that you are running for. For example, John Smith for District Judge. The statement should not be made John Smith District Judge because to the public it looks as though you are the incumbent. It should be clear that if you are not an incumbent for office that you do not currently hold that office, which is why the committee encourages the use of elector for in campaign advertisements. Another important aspect of the use of the word judge in a judicial campaign is when a judicial candidate has previously served as an ad hoc, pro tem, or mayor's magistrate judge. Kelly and I will more thoroughly discuss this issue now with regard to an important Judiciary Commission case you should be aware of. So Kelly, when I was talking about the use of the word judge during a judicial campaign, you've actually had an interesting case come before the commission regarding the use of the word judge in judicial campaigns, right? Yes. In the Henry Cassio case, the court publicly censured that judge because it found that by using the word judge in his campaign materials, it was misleading to the public and made the public believe that he was already an incumbent judge. In that case, it was a situation in which the judge had served as an ad hoc judge. And in accepting that appointment, he had signed him paperwork that said he would not represent to the public that he had at any point been elected as a judge previously. However, when the judge began running for office, the judge in his campaign materials had the statement, the, in all capital letters, qualified judge. When confronted about this possible violation, the judge did not destroy and remove those materials. The judge simply added, will be before the capitalized V. The commission brought this to the court with a recommendation of discipline, and the court did publicly censure the judge, finding that it was a misrepresentation, and the materials did leave the public with the impression that this judge was an incumbent judge. It's an interesting case, and it comes up a lot in front of the Campaign Oversight Committee, and this is a great example of how it can come all the way to the Judiciary Commission once it's with us at the Campaign Oversight Committee. Just because you've served as an ad hoc or a pro tem, you have to clearly state those facts. It's okay to use that in your record to show that you've had some judicial experience, but calling yourself a judge when you aren't one is prohibited. Yes. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Another important restriction in the code is that you may not publicly endorse or oppose another candidate for public office. With the advent of social media, the posting of pictures with judges has become problematic. Again, Kelly and I want to talk to you about this aspect of social media use. Kelly, one thing that we've seen since the advent of social media is the posting of pictures with judges. Just explain to judicial candidates why that's such an important issue, not just for them, but for judges who are already in office. Judges are not allowed to endorse candidates, public officials, judicial candidates as well. And 
by appearing in a picture with someone who's running for judicial office or any office, it is an implicit endorsement and the public could interpret it that way. The code does not allow for judges to endorse. That's Canon 7. But the code also does not allow judges to use the prestige of his or her office to benefit or help someone else's private interests. And it could, an argument could be made that by allowing himself or herself to be seen in a picture uh, with a candidate, they're using the prestige of their office to benefit that other person's personal interest in their, their quest for, for judicial office. Absolutely. So that's important to understand that your actions as a judicial candidate can affect sitting judges if you're not careful with what you're posting on those social media sites. Social media is so quick and easy to use, and as I've noted throughout this presentation, it creates issues in judicial campaigns, and this is an important one because you're not only creating an issue for yourself as a judicial candidate, you're creating an issue for a sitting judge. Yes. And maybe your colleague one day. Yes. Absolutely. A similar issue could arise at functions where you ask a sitting judge to walk you around the room to introduce you to people. That also could be, could be interpreted as an endorsement. Absolutely. Judges must remain impartial at all times. And this is just another example of that. Yes. Thanks, Kelly. Canon 7A11 prohibits you as a judicial candidate from making pledges, promises, or commitments that are inconsistent with the impartial performance of judicial duties. In keeping with the holding of Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, our Committee on Judicial Ethics issued an ethics advisory opinion on responding to judicial questionnaires on hotly debated issues. This opinion states that you may respond to such questionnaires, but you should carefully read Opinion 249, which is available on our website, to ensure compliance with its mandates. Again, the purpose of this webinar was to go over the most important restrictions in Canon 7 and the issues that are seen most prevalently by the Judicial Campaign Oversight Committee. When making decisions regarding ethical conduct, you should thoroughly review Canon 7 to decide whether your conduct will be in compliance with its restrictions. My contact information is available and I encourage you to call me with any questions or concerns regarding your ethical conduct.